Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Everybody interested in finding the true history of the Giza Plateau and the Sphinx will have no doubt heard the theory proposed by geology professor Robert Schock and the late great John Anthony West that the Sphinx was originally a lion that was subject to water erosion. The theory states that this could only have happened between 5000 and 10500 BC, a time period that is far older than the orthodox date attributed to the construction of the Sphinx, which is between 2558 and 2532 BC. When they went public with their discovery, the revelations shocked the world, but they were backed up by the best-selling authors and researchers Graham Hancock and Robert Boval, who offered supporting evidence that the Sphinx, which they also believe was once a lion, was built facing due east, looking out towards the rising equinox sun during the processional age of Leo. With all of this evidence together, it is a sound hypothesis, and many of you watching this video today will no doubt have bought into it, as did I. And why shouldn't you? How can you argue with science? But what we see so often is that many new theories that claim to know the age of the Giza necropolis, proclaiming that the structures are all many thousands of years older than the conventional date, seem to overlook science. But this should always be our starting point. Robert Schock of Boston University went about it the right way, in that he started with the science to build a narrative when he noticed clear signs of water erosion on the Sphinx complex. Shock, a geologist, is certain that it was precipitation induced, and he claims that Egyptian rainfall hasn't been heavy enough to create this type of erosion since between 12,000 and 7,000 years ago. Another independent geologist, Colin Reader, who was inspired by Shock's claims, conducted his own in depth field study on the Sphinx, and noted, like Shock, that water erosion is prevalent, but also that it was not evenly distributed at the site, with heavier water erosion on the western enclosure wall than anywhere else, including the Sphinx itself, a claim that cannot be disputed and is now almost universally accepted. There is no question that the Sphinx enclosure is affected by water erosion, which is certainly precipitation induced. But how do geologists explain the differing levels of weathering? Why is there more water erosion on the western wall than anywhere else? Well, in their studies, Reader and Shock have concluded that the heavily weathered western enclosure wall was not eroded by rainfall per se, but rather rainwater runoff. The theory perfectly explains how you get localised extreme water erosion on one side of the enclosure and why it is weaker on the others, as well as the Sphinx itself. If you look at topographical maps of the Giza Plateau, you'll quickly notice that it slopes eastwards, causing rainwater to naturally run off into the western part of the Sphinx enclosure, which would erode the limestone along the exposed western enclosure walls, exploiting any exposed joints in the rock cut face and exaggerating them, leaving the morphology we see today. Reader and Shock are in agreement that the water erosion predates the orthodox age of the Sphinx, but they contrast in their opinion of just how old the Sphinx and its complex are. Shock believes that the erosion levels mean that it must have been carved during the African humid period, when rainfall was higher, and he offers an estimate of between 5000 and 7000 BC. But Reader thinks that the erosion proves that the Sphinx is only hundreds and not thousands of years earlier than the commonly held dates. Reader, like Robert Temple, the major proponent of the Anubis Sphinx hypothesis, believes that the Sphinx is Old Kingdom. Whatever the truth, the studies by the two independent geologists prove that the Sphinx must predate the Giza pyramids, as the same levels of water erosion are not seen inside the Giza pyramid quarries situated to the west of the Sphinx. Furthermore, it must also predate Campbell's tomb, the famous Osiris shaft, which is also to the west of the Sphinx and doesn't have any water erosional features in the upper parts. Furthermore, the pyramid quarries to the west could not have been dug out before the Sphinx, because they would have disrupted the surface flow of the water into the Sphinx complex. If they were there before the Sphinx, the deep erosional features we see today on the western wall of the Sphinx enclosure would never have formed. Therefore, it is a scientific fact that the Great Pyramid and the Pyramids of Khafre and Menkore came some time after the Sphinx was carved. Reader and Shock also agree that the Sphinx was carved by a different culture than the dynastic Egyptians, with Reader believing that a solar cult once existed on the plateau, but like the culture that built Nabd the Player, it is now long forgotten. He believes that this solar cult created the Sphinx as a lion, which faced the rising sun in the east. 
Lions have long been associated with sun worship by various cultures across the ancient world. In fact, the oldest anthropomorphic figurine is a lion-headed deity from 32,000 years ago. The enormous ancient lion sphinx explains the array of recumbent lion artefacts found in Lower Egypt, which continued to be made all the way up to the 4th dynasty, as seen with the Khufu-inscribed ceramic lion found at Saqqara. These artefacts were probably created in the likeness of the Sphinx, which could well have been a representation of the solar deity of this now lost culture. As pointed out by researcher and author Andrew Collins, there were also a number of other Sphinx-like lion statues found in Lower Egypt that, like the Great Sphinx, show evidence of being re-carved to incorporate a human head. This defacement, seen on both large and small scale, shows that the recumbent lion deity no doubt lost importance in the Old Kingdom due to the growing importance of the new religion, implemented by the dynastic Egyptians. So, to recap, Robert Schock believes that the Sphinx weathering requires more persistent rainfall and large amounts of time for it to be correct, and he proposes that it was made during the African humid period between 5000 and 7000 BC. Interestingly, Reader believes that the conditions in the Old Kingdom between 2800 and 2600 BC were sufficient to create the weathering. Reader published a geomorphological study of the Giza necropolis in the Journal of Archaeology, in which he explains there was a transition period between the rainy conditions in Egypt and the later arid conditions. During this transition phase, rain became less persistent and more seasonal, as arid conditions became interspersed with flash floods. Compared to the African humid period, storms were now more intense but short-lived. They would have caused rapid water accumulation on the surface of the Giza Plateau, as the rain would not have been able to percolate into the ground fast enough. It would have then flowed according to the surface topography, which is eastwards across the Giza Plateau and into the Sphinx enclosure, avalanching over the enclosure wall of the Sphinx, causing the deep fissures seen in the western wall. The limestone of the Sphinx is very soft, and I, like Reader, believe that if the Sphinx and its enclosure were built between 7000 and 5000 BC, as Shock speculates, they would be far more eroded than they are today. But I also think that if they were built between 2800 and 2600 BC, as Reader believes, they should be far less eroded than we see today. As stated in a previous video, this transition between North Africa being a lush, green, wet savanna and then becoming an arid desert actually began quite suddenly, at around 3500 BC. This is backed up by paleoclimatic data from a number of sources. This transition continued into the Old Kingdom as the arid conditions continued to grow in strength, and the rainstorms became less and less frequent. Egypt today is far drier than it was between 4 and 5000 years ago. In my opinion, and as Reader points out, as the Sphinx and its eastern wall exhibit far less water erosional features than the western wall, in some places it is non-existent, it is not likely to be as old as Shock claims, and clearly wasn't subject to the regular rain that we saw in the African humid period. If it was, then the Sphinx would have formed the vertical gullies similar to those displayed on the western wall, but it doesn't. But also, as Shock points out, it is unlikely to have been built in the Old Kingdom dynastic period, as this is too young, and there probably wasn't enough physical rain at Giza, even though there were the occasional floods. Also, building a huge lion in dynastic times really doesn't tie in with a new dynastic religion or mythology. If the Sphinx was built in this era, as Robert Temple points out, the Sphinx is more likely to have been the jackal-headed god Anubis. With all of the research I've done, which of course is ongoing, I now have my own context and narrative for the creation of the Giza Plateau, and the geology, climatology and archaeology seem to back up my claims. As stated in previous videos, I believe the Giza pyramids were built around 3100 BC, the first grand project by the first dynastic king of Egypt, Nama, and taking all the evidence into account, I place the Sphinx at around 3500 BC, at the end of the African humid period, where flash floods were commonplace, but rain was not constant. Therefore, my dating is somewhere between Shock's and Reader's hypotheses, and I think it fits both the geological and climatological evidence. This date of 3500 BC therefore means that the Sphinx is a product of the pre-dynastic cultures of Lower Egypt, that probably migrated towards the Nile with the onset of desertification in North Africa. 
Interestingly, the Giza Plateau is littered with pre-dynastic finds, such as a collection of ceramic jars that were found at the foot of the Great Pyramid, typical in style to the early cultures of Lower Egypt before they were conquered by the Nakeda III culture from Upper Egypt, sometime between 3200 and 3000 BC. This conquering Nakeda III culture formed what is called the Proto-Dynastic Period, notable for being the era that introduced hieroglyphs and irrigation, created royal cemeteries, and began using serex or royal crests. This is the culture that unified Upper and Lower Egypt, and from it was born dynastic history, and the first dynastic king of Egypt, Nama. In fact, Nama is believed to be the last Nakeda king, as well as the first of the dynastic era. There is also evidence that the site of the Giza Plateau was cleared before the pyramid building project began, as dumps of pre-dynastic material have been discovered. Together with the quarrying in the region, as well as the activities of the subsequent dynasties, it is no surprise that there is not a great deal left from this pre-dynastic Sphinx building era on the site. But we can certainly prove to Egyptologists that the Giza Plateau was populated before the days of Khufu in the 4th dynasty. When you look closely at the geology of the site, what is clear is that the Sphinx predates everything else, and it was certainly carved before the pyramids were built, due to the fact that the quarries would have obstructed the direction of the rainwater runoff into the Sphinx complex. It is also clear that although the Sphinx is an exquisite work of art, it is nothing compared to the Giza Pyramid project. Using the geology and the weathering, the general order of development at Giza, and the fact that we find indigenous Lower Egypt pre-dynastic finds on the plateau, I believe that the Sphinx was built around 3500 BC, by the indigenous Lower Egyptian culture, who, I might add, did not worship gods such as Osiris, Horus and Anubis. These were brought into the area by the conquering Nakeda III people from 3200 BC onwards. Taking Anubis as an example, he is a product of the Nakeda culture, which is separated into three periods of time, Nakeda 1, 2 and 3, each of which flourished exclusively in Upper Egypt during pre-dynastic times, not in Lower Egypt, where Giza is located. The first jackal carving originates from the Nakeda II period, also known as the Gerzian, around 3500 BC, and these people lived in the southern Egyptian power centres where the dynastic religion began. Anubis was not worshipped in the north until Egypt was unified between 3200 and 3000 BC, the period when the conquerors from the south took control and introduced their religion as well as their rule into northern territories. I know there is discussion about the original identity of the Sphinx, as many of you know from watching my previous video, but for the Sphinx to have originally been a carving of Anubis, I believe that is only possible if it was built in the Old Kingdom, because in pre-dynastic times, the people of Giza simply did not follow that religion. Also, the Sphinx is very similar in appearance to the recumbent line depictions found in pre-dynastic Lower Egypt, as mentioned in my previous video, which says to me it is certainly possible that the Sphinx was once a lion. So, in summary, I would hazard a calculated guess that the Sphinx and the Giza Pyramids were built by two different cultures. I think that the Sphinx, as well as the reported underground passages and tunnels, were built by the indigenous Lower Egyptian culture who migrated towards the Nile around 3500 BC, a time when Giza may still have been green as the African humid period abruptly ended. But, from that time onwards, the Sphinx would have been subject to flash floods that caused the erosion that we see. Then, sometime between 3200 and 3000 BC, I believe that the conquering Nakeda III culture took control of the Giza Plateau. They cleared it, adopted the Sphinx, dug the Giza quarries, and then built the pyramid complex. They may have even recarved the head of the Sphinx into a jackal at this point, to try and overprint this old pre-dynastic religion with their own culture, much like what we have seen in more recent history as many Christian churches were built over sacred pagan sites. The Nakeda III people, out of which the dynastic history of Egypt began, were an advanced culture, with strong associations with the lands of Canaan and Mesopotamia, and are the only culture in the whole of Egypt at that time who I believe could have had the knowledge, capabilities and opportunity to build the Pyramids of Giza. I will focus on this culture in more detail in a future video. They were known as the Horus Kings of Egypt, and I believe they were the true Pyramid Builders. From this study, a few facts cannot be disputed when you look at the geology of Giza.
The pyramids cannot be thousands of years older than the accepted date, else the quarries would show substantial water erosional features. And nobody can doubt that these quarries were the origin of the bulk of the pyramid stone due to the rock type comparison work by independent geologists. Therefore, the pyramids could only have been built after the African humid period came to an end, and the Sphinx was, without doubt, the first large construction on the Giza Plateau, and a date of around 3500 BC seems to be the most likely, which, in my opinion, means that originally it could not have been a representation of Anubis, as that god didn't enter the region until some time after 3200 BC. The conquerors of Egypt, the powerful Nakeda III culture, took control of Egypt, the Sphinx and the Labyrinth of Tunnels between 3200 and 3000 BC, and then they planned and constructed the grandest building project the world has ever seen, and I believe it was a project to stop the desertification of Egypt, a phenomena that could well have been caused by an annual violent and terrifying meteor shower that changed the world as we know it. Thank you for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.